So thank you very much, everyone. Hope you had a nice coffee break and could chat a bit. And let's continue. So um, then, um, at first, I would like to ask if anybody would like to ask something to Professor Strovel. Um, yes, Ala, I, I have a question about your summary of Padawan and the following cases. Um, there is one element we have been particularly discussing in, in Germany, which I didn't see, or maybe I overheard it in the load of information you gave to us, and that's the question about the burden of proof. Um, there was great emphasis, and when it comes down to applying uh, the rules, for example, to a certain, is there private use? Uh, can there be private use by non-private entities? Can it be presumed that non-private entities also make some minor private copying and what happens then? Uh, whether, for example, that exception, uh, that, uh, that rule, would, how does it translate into a burden, the burden of proof rule? Because in the end, that is the, the, the problem. Uh, probably neither side can really prove the contrary. So whoever bears the burden of proof finally has either to pay or not to pay. And I was a little astonished uh, you didn't mention that, so maybe you could explain a little bit uh, in addition on, on this point. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that's one of the issues where the court uh, developed its reasoning in the Copidan decision. Uh, and I think that that's the, the small block that comes on top of uh, the previous decision. Uh, it's it's clearly not a burden of proof. I didn't have the time to uh, present copy done in details, but the burden of proof uh, uh, would be uh, uh, for the, the buyers uh, in this case uh, that it's used uh, um, for professional use. So. Uh, I agree the issue of the burden of proof uh, as always is is the most important one at the end in in practice and uh, i mean we we could discuss for other exceptions where the, the court puts the burden of proof but but here it, it was not clear in pattern one and I, I think after copy then it's it's not clear uh, so it's it's not for the right orders in in this case and that changed uh, the rules of the game thank you would anybody else like to ask something about private copying? All right, uh, maybe there are some questions concerning other presentations now. <laughs> Everything clear? That's usual in council working parties. <laughs> Um, I just uh, got a um, question f uh, from uh, sent to our email address. I'll just read. We'll see what sense it makes. So, as was uh, as was mentioned in Jonathan Griffith's presentation, exceptions and limitations are the right under Charter. And in regarding that the libraries realize one of the human right right to access to information. Should be libraries' rights to use copyright protected works regulated under national legislation, or it must be done better at European Union or even at international level? So, regarding libraries' exception. And the question is addressed to all speakers. Um, well, I think. Um, the court and more generally we place both too little value on fundamental rights right, like the right to freedom of information and also too much in some respect. We expect those rights um, to do more than they're capable of doing really um, and I, I don't think if we go and look at um, the detailed jurisprudence on the concept of access to information under, let's say, Article 10 of the um, uh, European Convention on Human Rights or Article 11 under the Charter, then we're going to get detailed answers to what we should do about libraries. Clearly, we need to you know, foster libraries. Some sort of suitable uh, solution needs to be worked out. But this seems to me precisely the example of a situation that a fundamental right cannot 
solve, really. I mean, if we, if we try to get outside the difficult task of trying to weigh up a suitable balance between the conflicting interests by kicking it into the sort of fundamental rights distance, then, then we're not going to get a proper answer, I, I, I would say. So. Anyone else has a view on... Well, I think it's, it's strange in the case law, sometimes the reference to fundamental rights helps the court to build a, a true solution uh, or a true response. And in other cases, it's purely rhetorical. Uh, but for instance, I think into UPC Telecable, uh, the reference then led to something <laughs> quite practical, uh, the fact that now there is a procedural obligation to be uh, you have to allow the user, after the injunction has been granted, uh, to claim their uh, rights. And that was based on the freedom to access information. So there, strangely, the balancing leads to something which is quite uh, concrete and, and quite requiring because you have to, to set the, this procedure. But in, in other cases, of course, it doesn't lead to something, I would say, uh, substantial. So. How does it come from? But uh, there are differences there. Yeah. Uh, okay. um, just to adding up, because you mentioned UPC uh, Taylor Cable, what I find so interesting about this case is not only the use of the fundamental rights as such and the references, but also, um, well, the ease with which the court imposes obligations stemming from fundamental rights on private parties in the end. So if I understood the decision correctly, they are saying that, well, after the blocking of websites, it's um, the ISP um, who has to take care of uh, users still being able of enjoying sufficient freedom of expression and so on. So this is a, a very interesting development that uh, the fundamental rights are seen as a framework not only between individual citizens and the state, but also in the relation between uh, private parties or contractual um, obligations in that case. So that's quite remarkable, I think. Yes, and... Um with the German law background, at least, I would say that primarily the fundamental rights are to be taken into account by the legislator by balancing exactly through concrete legislative provisions, balancing the different fundamental rights or human rights of the authors and other fundamental rights. Um, so that's one thing, one aspect of it. Uh, when we come to the European level, we have seen already that um, not only the diversity of laws are, is quite high, but also, in fact, uh, the development of libraries is quite different. I know this because I was uh, a, a co-responsible, so to say, for the public lending right um, provisions in the 19... <laughs> in the Rental Right Directive, and um, there we studied that, and we could see that in the south of Europe, uh, public libraries are much less developed and, um, than in the north. Um, so it's always, you have to take these aspects also into account uh, when trying to do something. And as we said before, for the European Union competence, it's a question of, move, uh, of a major um, obstacle to free movement of uh, goods or services, which has to be ascertained, which has to be verified, and which must be there so that the EU at regional level could uh, legislate. And um, if you see already that it's, that it's quite difficult on the European level to come to one common um, solution, I don't see it all the more at the international level where you have much more differences between statutes of development in general um, both are in fact and in law than within the EU. So, well, that's... Thank you. On, also on mentioning UPC Telecarbon and Scarlet Extended, I think it's interesting, you know, we can have a total cynic, but I think what the court does there is, this is that seems to me to be the best example of the way in which the court uses the charter to populate um, an area of the law where there was nothing previously. So you interpret very broad provisions relating to enforcement. If you add the requirement to honour 
a, a, a fair balance in that context, then you begin to trace rules, which of course is what you see in UPC telecouple. Don't you? you? You initially start by kind of imposing negative conditions, say you know the, the law cannot go beyond these points, but slowly through a series of references that come thereafter, because you've got to have a law that sits between these two points, I think you, you create the law using fundamental rights. I think that's what the, the, the court has done, really. Whether it would have been any different if they had simply employed proportionality, in a sense, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, really. So. Thank you. So, the question? Yeah, I have also a general question, but it starts from uh, two things that I've heard from Silk's presentation and Jonathan's presentation. Um, Silk, you said that um, you you think that the European Court of Justice has just imposed the outer limits of copyright exception, but the member states are still free to um, to make the conditions of the exception rest more restrictive than what is in the direct I'm, I'm not sure that I agree with you because I think that in the main case it is clear that actually the court says you have to take it as it is and you cannot just uh, put other condition than those that are in the in the in in the in the condition in, in the the exceptions but then um, Jonathan you said that at, at the end of a presentation you were in favor of more detailed uh, exceptions and for instance, in the, uh, the DRTV2 Denmark case, the court said the same, said if you take the exception, you have to take it as it is, not uh, putting additional conditions to it. But the difference between the DEC main and the, the, the TV2 Denmark case is that the TV2 Denmark case is an exception that is rather detailed in the directive, while the parody exception is not detailed at all in the directive. So my question is uh, for all of you, how would you actually, what would be the way forward to uh, draft an exception in a, uh, uh, in a revised directive? Would it draft it in general terms, like for parody or for educational use, for instance, or rather in a precisely detailed uh, uh, way in order to, uh, to reduce the, the, the margin for member states? Somewhere between those two things, I suppose. I mean, it, I think there's a real risk here that we we almost panic. That you have a, a mess that needs to be sorted it out, and it needs to be sorted out kind of today, really. And clearly, things do need to be done. Um, but you know, this is a really, really big task that is underway, really. And you you can't just bring together the cultures of a number of different member states in this really important area tomorrow. Um, you know, maybe we can make uh, advances from where we... So if, if you take parody as an example, it might be possible, for example, to specify a little further the conditions that might be apl applicable to a parody exception. So um, it might be possible, for example, to confirm whether or not uh, both target and weapon parodies are applicable and whether or not it applies to purely commercial I mean, I, I don't even know if that's necessarily a good idea. You, you don't want something that's incredibly detailed, but we already know certain further things, and I think it would be helpful to um, incorporate those. I mean, what we're caught between here, we want, not only do we want something perfect tomorrow, we want something that is both legally certain and flexible. Well, it just can't happen, can it? Um, it's, not, it's not just that we can't find the answer, the answer just doesn't exist. Um, so, um, you know, some steps towards further definition, not thinking, oh, well, it'll all be perfect tomorrow, but it might be a bit less imperfect, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would like first to say, before tackling your question, um, I think one step further uh, on the exceptions uh, issue is maybe just to make them 
mandatory. I think that would already bring, I think, more certainty. Um, I think concerning the drafting of the exceptions, uh, it, it, it depends on the type of, of exception involved. I think the exceptions which relate more to freedom of expression and, and which have a, an expressive aspect like, like parody, quotation, there I think you should remain with broad terms uh, because there is some flexibility that will directly rely on uh, freedom of expression and, and, and the balancing. For other types of exception, I think exceptions for education, for instance, in principle, that should be much more detailed, I think, into law. But the problem is that I don't think it's possible at the EU level because uh, the system uh, and the education system, the financing of libraries and, and so on are completely different. There I agree uh, with uh, what Zilke said and uh, it makes it uh, more complicated. But for those types of exceptions, uh, I think it would m make more sense to have something more detailed, why we can keep some open-ended uh, language for uh, other exceptions involving um, expression and expressive derivative uh, uh, users, uh, I think. So it depends. But uh, at least, I mean, if we think that something should be done, I would start with making the exceptions mandatory. And, and I haven't done any study, but I think Quite a lot of countries have introduced more exceptions, at least the UK. So, so basically, to, the list w which was purely uh, optional becomes, in a sense, maybe <laughs> mandatory at least. So, make all the exceptions mandatory would not be such a problem. Uh, I, I don't know exactly the situation in all the countries because they have added maybe exceptions uh, or, uh, since since uh, f 14 years now. Um, yes, that, that's it. I don't know whether it's an answer. Uh, the, the other issues, I think, for consideration are all the cross-border issues. And I think that they, they, they are maybe not involved uh, with uh, certain types of, of uh, exceptions, uh, like uh, parody exceptions or education exceptions. So there is maybe less reason for the, the EU to do more on those exceptions. Uh, but I haven't thought about all the, the exceptions considering those which might more often bring uh, cross-border issues. So yeah, I was, yeah. Just, I was just wondering about yeah, yeah. the two examples you give because if a parody or uh, an education uh, or, or a course is happening online, it will have a cross-border dimension. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course. Uh, but it depends on the localization of the making available, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Indeed, I mean, th there there are no exceptions which are solely analog. Maybe except maybe to, to reprography exceptions, there might be others uh, in a sense that are solely analog. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, to think further is is would be just to distinguish the exceptions depending whether they are more uh, significant for digital users or for analog users, and to treat them differently uh, according to that. But okay, that's just uh, brainstorming. No, that's actually what I said also in my talk, that it's one alternative to distinguish between those exceptions or those uses which are predominantly transborder uses, cross-border uses, and others which are more local ones. And um, coming back on parody, I just had this idea, maybe we will once uh, harmonize European humor what this is. I have no idea. I think there are quite many differences of what is considered as humor or not, <laughs> no longer <laughs> in different uh, member states. But to come back uh, to your question, Severine, um, just to make sure you got me right, I did not mean that we need to have specific limitations in any case. The first question is always, of course, to check whether there is a need for have, having either a more specific or different limitation as uh, compared to now, or an additional one. Um, so and if you have seen the need, then the question is, should it be rather specific or uh, broad? And then your question also was, uh, well, if this is so, like I think historically is a fact that the member states wanted to keep this flexibility between the outer framework and 
and the possibility to have no exceptions or to have this flexibility in between. If this is still true, um, I think, well, Oh, the only thing you need to harmonize is this outer framework and there you can be specific and for the rest there is then this flexibility. I think still that this is the concept of the Article 5 and I believe also that one can interpret the parody case and by the court as only referring to this outer limit because this is the only thing which has been harmonized. That's a way of interpreting the court case in my view. Um, it's, I know there are different ways and different opinions, but I still think that is possible. And that's also an example for what I meant if I said, when I said that the um, court cases may still not bring total clarity or uh, legal certainty because they may be subject to different uh, kinds of interpretation which seem possible. <coughs> Well, I think, um, well, first of all, I think uh, the, the, the exceptions and limitations should be mandatory. Um, and then I think that Jonathan's presentation actually gave um, all the necessary information for a reality check. I mean, uh, you mentioned the different influence factors and we see that the court, whatever you put in the legislation will refer to fundamental rights. Uh, the court, whatever you put in the legislation will refer to the three-step test if it stays. And um, so when doing the legislation, you can, you can kind of anticipate on that. So it's logical that a limitation that has a large link with a fundamental right must be rather broad, because if you make it too specific, the court will override the specific legislation anyway by referring to freedom of expression or privacy or freedom to conduct a business directly. And if there is a limitation that um, has a very large impact on the market for the copyrighted work, then it makes no sense to make it overly broad because the court will override an overly broad provision anyway by referring to the normal exploitation test of the three-step test, as we have now seen in private copying cases. So these are quite clear guidelines. And I think in terms of sustainability, um, of the legislation. We also mentioned the, the, the impact factors. Um, if you include an opening clause that leaves room for developing new limitations, then the listed cases can be more specific. Because if you have overlooked something, then there is still this safety valve uh, that offers room for devising something new where this is necessary. If you don't have an opening clause, I think the listed cases should rather be prototypes and not so much uh, precisely defined exceptions and limitations. So I guess along those lines, you can find uh, reasonable answers to the question how the catalog uh, should look like. But I think in any case, as Alain also said, a mandatory list would, would help a lot in terms of legal certainty and harmonization. Sorry, can I, <clears throat> having the microphone in my hand, just take the opportunity to seize it? Because actually, I mean, Severine, the, the question initially was about this idea that if you take from the list, you take the whole thing. Because actually the situation is even slightly more complicated because I come here from, I've been speaking, um, I gave a presentation in, in Denmark and it was about parody. There was an event about parody and I, anybody would think parody was a lot more important than it actually is in a sense from this discussion, wouldn't they? But people there were concerned that these decisions were not just having an impact upon the exceptions and limitations that are specifically called exceptions and limitations within their legislation, because actually they deal with parody. I mean, there may well be somebody here who's much better capable of, of, of explaining this than me, but as a, um, a qualification on the infringement principle. So parodies are permitted, not because they're exempted, but because it's not an infringement. And they were really worried, or well, not worried, but they, they were thinking, well, well, what happens now if, if this is a complete code of exceptions and limitations? To what extent can we keep our non-infringement principle um, in place? So, you know, there's, there's all sorts of thoughts about kind of the wreckage that has been wrought uh, 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 across the legislation going on. I, I have a question because after listening to 
to all the excellent presentations, I'm not yet capable of uh, squaring my circle. Uh, so, uh, and, and maybe Jonathan is right. Maybe there is not such a thing as uh, legal certainty and flexibility in the same world. Uh, and I, I know Martin tried to sketch a possible solution, but I'm, I'm still a, a bit lost. And I'll get to that, but on a number of things have just been said. Just make the list of exceptions mandatory. So what? What is that going to improve? We're going to be left with the same level of uncertainty and difficulty sometimes for those exceptions that have, in certain instances, a cross-border effect as to how, how do we make a digital single market work. I mean, maybe some of the exceptions we should have never put our hands in it, on it. I mean, why did we need to uh, decide that there was an exception and that we will decide if there was an exception for ephemeral copies for purposes of broadcasting? I mean, that is something that you may say, even, even if it's digital, does it have a cross-border effect? Does it really affect the function of the internal market? We are where we are, but just by making the list mandatory, I, I doubt we are going to, to advance. And then uh, the trick is going to be trying to decide which, which ones have a cross-border potential or reality, and there, where do you get into them in order to get from the generality to the too to much specificity. But we are left with the question of uh, but what's going to happen because technology evolves and then the course will be looking into the new thing that is happening and trying to sh yes, get them into the framework we have given them in the definition of the rights and the definition of the exceptions and very funny things happen. Not only with the exceptions, if you see what's been happening with hyperlinking and, and the court of justice, the court has just been trying to get to what probably is a reasonable result for many people in particular if you're linking to to content that is being put on, on the web with the authorization of the right holders, but by creating or using concepts that should not have been put there in the first place, like the new public concept that is a complete mess. But how do we inject? And there, Martin, you were saying, uh, okay, let's, let's have like an open norm. It's almost like a little bit of a fair dealing type of included, generally applicable for, for the exceptions and limitation at EU level. But I am still, puzzle as to how that will work. You were saying, and you're right, civil judges are capable of interpreting law. I agree. They do that with the civil courts, which come from the Napoleonic uh, times. But the question is not that one. The question is whether civil judges in 26 countries at the moment, plus those in UK and Ireland, are going to get to similar conclusions in their interpretation of the law on the basis of that open safety valve that you refer to. And I don't think it's very, uh, you know, it's quite clear what the answer to that is going to be and what the <laughs> next step is, which is the court of justice again, having to intervene even more often that already is the case now today. So that's my first unanswer uh, question. And the second you were saying, well, you, you took the example of Google Images and you say, well, these are other issues. Uh, these, these is in the end legal uncertainty uh, as to whether that type of services is covered by a quotation or an implied license or what you have, what have you. These are problems for SMEs, which I agree. I mean, uh, that, 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 that type of situation is, is easier to deal with those that have enough money to litigate. But that will not be solved by the solution you're uh, presenting. That will not be solved by the security vault that will say you may be able as well to apply this in, in similar cases. You will not solve that legal certainty and you will still have to go and litigate and therefore those that have the possibility to litigate will use it more than, than the others. I don't have an answer to the, the problem but I just thought uh, maybe you want to reconsider it. So, so here comes the answer to all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, first of all, <clears throat> I think that um, um, the, the idea of having an opening clause must always be seen in connection with um, uh, the specific cases that are listed. So in terms of civil law tradition, it's rather an opening clause to apply cases that are similar to those listed by analogy, which is something that, that happens in other areas of private law as well. Um, to give you an example, um, before the um, implementation of the copyright directive into Dutch law, we had a decision of the Dutch Supreme Court um, where the court looked at the exceptions that were already in the list of specific cases and it couldn't find an exception that, that would fit directly um, 
that, that would directly cover the use that was made. But the court said, well, okay, it looks very much like this particular case, but it is not really that. And it looks also a lot like this other case, and it is not really that. So by analogy, we, we take those two together and we arrive at the conclusion that we are confronted with something that looks so much like these two cases where the legislator clearly told us this is okay and this is permissible, that we also permit this third kind of use. You could also say that the Court of Justice, in a sense, has already started with this process um, because the list, the closed list, just no longer complies with the reality we are facing in the digital environment. So when you look at the TU Darmstadt decision, which uh, Jonathan mentioned, there the court is also kind of rever reverse engineering by saying, okay, the list tells us there is an exception allowing reading terminals and libraries, but this exception we think does not really make sense if the library cannot do digitization. So let's look for another case that also comes into play, and then they broaden this, and then they also think about the user and they say, well, for this to be really useful for users, they must be able to make a copy. So let's include the private copying exception also. And then they combine at the end of the day three different specific types and they say, well, we combine all those three and we arrive at a use privilege that is basically reflecting what is in the archive, but still is a new animal that was not mentioned as such. And then the court says, oh, perhaps we go a bit too far here, but don't worry, we have the three-step test, so we also add an obligation to pay equitable remuneration. And then um, you have a package where the court applied several specific cases from the list and the three-step test and arrives at a tailor-made solution. So I think that um, the way in which civil law judges on the continent would deal with an opening clause would look very much like this approach. And then the question, the, the second question: Would it would it solve? Um, uh, would it lead to um, uh, more harmonisation, uh, less litigation, and so on? Not by definition. I mean, of course, you need somebody who finally says, "Okay, this is wrong, and this is right." But the advantage is that um, when you have walk down that road and the Court of Justice finally says the right interpretation of the normal exploitation criterion regarding this use must be the following, then this is true for all 28 member states. And with the piecemeal approach that we have now where the courts invent around um, the, the um, uh, structure of exceptions and limitations because they just cannot work with this in a reasonable manner um, is, is far from that. I mean, um, if I am a small medium enterprise, small medium sized enterprise and I'm operating in the Netherlands and I hear the Court of Justice saying, okay, uh, your use of a search service does not fall under the right of quotation because what the Dutch courts have said about the right of quotation is excessive, then you know that for the Netherlands but you still don't know what the law would be in Germany, Spain or France where the courts have follow different routes. But if the decision was based on, um, let's say, an interpretation of normal exploitation or unreasonable prejudice or something, then this is true for all 28 member states and you can rely on that. So the value that you finally get, the value for money, let's say, that you finally get after all this lengthy litigation would, I think, be very much enhanced if you keep it within the copyright framework instead of encouraging courts to invent around it and come up with uh, some other solutions. Uh, I guess, I mean, my fear is in, in ways, what you describe works wonderfully if it was one jurisdiction. When it's 20 jurisdictions, uh, sorry, whether it is uncertainty because they have to invent in order to arrive to a conclusion, or whether there will be the judge in Italy that will say, yes, this activity is like quotation, and the judge in the UK that will say, oh, this activity is like incidental inclusion. We are back to a square one. I mean, what you're proposing in my view, but it's, it's not, I'm not criticizing for the sake of it because I don't have a better alternative or a different alternative, but it seems to me that increases flexibility at a high cost, which is a legal certainty. It, it, it lowers legal certainty too much if you look at it in the functioning of an internal market, which in the end is you know, what we started being here in the first place, but okay. 
Okay, but, but but then I have but then I have a question for you. I mean, where, where, honestly speaking, uh, where where is the legal certainty right now? I mean, um, looking at, at at copyright in an isolated way, you can say, oh, uh, concerning the, the the search engine question, there's lots and lots of legal cer legal certainty because we know that it does not fall under the right of quotation. So um, solved for you. I mean, your department don't has have to, has to deal with it because it's not under copyright, and then we don't care. And and. The, the judges just move on to other solutions, so the problem of legal uncertainty is shifted just to other areas like implied consent, like safe harbors, uh, like abuse of right, and so on and so forth. And you can still say, okay, um, in copyright we have lots and lots of legal certainty, but you have just bypassed the problem. So instead of enabling um, a, a development of the law based on copyright, um, you basically create something that does not do the job, and so the, the development of the law moves on and, and, and looks for other avenues. That's, that's the fear, I think. Yeah. I think the reply, uh, there's no clear reply. I, I, I think what Jonathan said before, which is don't panic, <laughs> is a good starting point. Uh, I think it passes by really, really identifying there where we need more clarity for the function of the internal market. And then, and it's when it comes interesting for member states, sitting around the table and agreeing more there is going to be a need to agree more. That doesn't mean full harmonization. That doesn't mean that we have to go up to the last detail. Uh, but if you want to have something that works across borders, and not everything needs to do cro uh, work across borders, you, you're going to have to get to some interesting discussions. But there is still that point of flexibility in the system, which is not totally an answer. And I recognize that as a difficult one. But, but an aspect of don't panic might be, well, the solution might be, you know, the, there might be difficulties for a while, but in the end, we might achieve a better solution through uh, a, a proposal such as Martin's. Yeah, at the same time, I think, Martin, you were happy with what the court said in TU Darmstadt, so uh, it, it works, it seems to work. <laughs> and uh, so, um, uh, yeah. yeah. It's a matter of logic that if you have only, like the three-step test, or only very broad thing, uh, conditions, you have more legal uncertainty than if you have quite precise terms. I mean, it's a matter of degree. I mean, if everything would be 100% legally certain, we would not have any courts and any litigation. Um, so there's everywhere some degree of legal certainty, but it's a question of how much. And I think it, there's a big difference between having already in the law quite uh, clear conditions for an exception as opposed to having sweeping conditions. Um, and then, uh, what else did I want to see? Uh, yes, I wanted to also agree with Maria on the um, question that, um, in my mind, the question of whether an exception is mandatory or not does not have any impact on legal certainty. Because if it's not mandatory, then you have the choice of countries to have such exception or not. But it's legally certain. You can look into the French law, to the Latvian law, to the Greek law, and you will know, okay, they have an exception, the others don't. Uh, they have these conditions, the others. So it's still legally certain, it's just diverse. So I, I agree in this respect. No impact on. <laughs> well, to come back on the issue of uh, whether the exception should be made mandatory or, or not, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm not sure that there should be a battle on the exceptions. And I'm not sure it's, it's worse all. I mean, what might happen if there is a decision by the Commission uh, to deal with the exception issues? There might be other more important issues. That's my view. But if there is a decision to tackle the exception, I think uh, to make them mandatory would really help. Uh, I think that there are different reasons, but the fact, of course, that uh, we have a, a judge, uh, I mean, the Court of Justice of the EU, which would be allowed to continue the definition. Of course, we agree it doesn't go far enough. It's, it's, it's too much a, an approach of constitutional judges sometimes, and we as private lawyers, we, we are not fully pleased with what they do, but I mean, it's their limitation. But at least because you have a decision, then the national judge, and, and if you would have all the exceptions mandatory in all the member states, the national judge 
which have other approach, not the one of the Court of Justice of the EU just balancing, which is sometimes, I think, not satisfactory, they would at least start to look a little bit more about uh, what is done in other countries. And I think for me, harmonization at some point uh, in an area like uh, copyright has to be done by the judge, but of course not only by the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, but uh, by the national judge. And the fact that you would have to more or less the same text in all the member states with decisions, and that judge can can compare the decisions. I mean, if there is, well, that's another issue, of course, the possibility to read the decisions in other uh, languages and and to have just a system to make the decisions available in in other languages, so that the judge can start a dialogue on the exception and maybe define them more <coughs> precisely. I think that, that is important. And for that, I think you, you need a mandatory system of exception. That's what I had proposed when I, I did the, the, the report, uh, the study for the commission in the mid-90s. And I remember that and I, I was shocked because we had a chapter <laughs> arguing that the exception should be mandatory because we, we had seen already among the 15 member states that there were a lot of diversions. And the commission was against uh, keeping this chapter, so we had to take it out of the study at the end of the day. But I think it's it's really important. So that's that's one uh, commentary. The other issue which we haven't discussed here, I think it's uh, the importance of economics uh, and and the economic substance behind the exceptions, because at the end of the day, I think copyright is a system to. I mean, allocate money in the right way, uh, and, and that's the core. So I think all issues which do not have a, a substantial economic aspect should, maybe should be left out of, of the discussion for the future. Uh, one, one of the issues, and I don't know what the answer is, is that we see that with the communication to the public, at least in certain cases, the courts bring forward the economic nature of the act, the profit-making nature of the act. So introducing in the analysis of the right an economic consideration, which I think is, is important for quite a lot of, of, of cases. That's for the definition of the communication to the public. We have just the opposite for reproduction. Uh, there is no reference uh, in the case law, I think, uh, in the definition of the right, it's only in Article 5.1 that there is the reference without uh, significant economic, uh, what's the term again? Uh, no, no independent economic significance, uh, which refers in the exception to an economic aspect. I, I think if we don't have this economic aspect in the definition of the right, then it should be uh, maybe as, as a subsidiary criterion in some of the exceptions. Uh, it is in 5.1, and, and basically I think it's the most important uh, conditions of 5.1. But why can't we think to have the same, no economic uh, significant, uh, uh, or no, no independent economy significance, or something like that, some language for other exceptions. I mean, that would open a lot, of course, and it's quite risky as well, but I think we need to have more economics in our reasoning in copyright, because in, in other fields of the law, in trademark, in patent, uh, I mean, the, 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 the exclusivity is, is more or less limited to the commercial. Uh, to the commercial sector. Uh, it's not the case in, in copyright, and I think that that's less and less uh, possible in, in the digital world. So it's, but it, that's again brainstorming. And I, I'm sure that some people would think that that would bring too much uncertainty in, in the system. Um, but I think it's reasonable to have some economic reasoning somewhere. Uh, may, I, may I directly respond to that? Um, Maybe I got you wrong, but um, there is a lot of economy in the Article 5. There are many exceptions and limitations which are subject to um, non-commercial activities. So um, that's our system also in, in all the national laws I know, that the right does not distinguish between commercial or non-commercial or economic or non-economic activities. Um, that's the same for the international conventions, which we have to obey, uh, which do not distinguish whether an act is commercial or not, but it's exactly in the list of exceptions that you can say, well, um, for non-commercial or insignificant uh, activities, there is an exception. I think that's the, the way 
consistent with international law. Yeah, but I think then it, it, uh, I, I agree. Uh, but to, to distinguish, and it's interesting just to see when the economic criterion has always already been included as a condition and maybe to distinguish uh, different groups of expression of exceptions a little bit more depending for instance on the uh, relevance or not of this economic uh, uh, condition and, and that would make the system maybe a little bit more uh, clear to, to have some exceptions with with that criterion included and if i may i also did not really understand yet for what mandatory exceptions would be, I mean, the making them mandatory would be important. You said it would be important, but I haven't really understood why or for what exactly. Well, first of all, for cross-border users, because you would be sure that uh, the same uh, exceptions apply in all the other countries, so that's an obvious one. And, and as well, because then there is a dialogue which is facilitated between the different uh, judge-made laws, uh, if I may say so, under the control of the Court of Justice of the EU. But if you are sure that you have the same exception in principle in all member states' law, you can then rely and, and look at what has been decided by some judge in another country, and that might help some form of harmonization by the judges, which I think at some point is necessary. You're very optimistic. I think about the time that judges have. In Germany, they always complain they don't have enough time. They have to be very quick. I don't think they would have really the, the capacity to look into foreign okay. judgments in addition. There, there's a cooperation between judge for competition law, and it works a lot. And it, it, it it's and in patent law. Too. Uh, yeah, so in patent law, the judge are I think it's and, and have regular meetings. Yeah, in patent law too, the judges have regular meetings across Europe to discuss specific cases. So I think that they would be happy. And maybe it's because I come from a small country like Alain in Belgium, but. Increasingly, you see references to uh, to case law of other countries in copyright cases, in a, and it is in, it is increasing. So, but also, sorry, yes, the mic is here. <laughs> it's not a question. I think the difference is the the answer to the solution is first. It's not about making all exceptions mandatory. Is which ones you have to make mandatory, and the second is. Is it sufficient to make them mandatory? No. And I think the disagreement is no. that I think a few of us think, no, it's not sufficient. You need to provide more guidance, otherwise they will continue not to work across borders. Sure, it's not sufficient, but it's a step further. I think harmonization, it's a long process. And I think we cannot say that because it, it will not ensure full harmonization, uh, that it shouldn't be a, a solution. I think it should still be considered. I think it's the next stage, which would not be satisfactory either, but I, I think it, it could help. And f for me, I mean, harmonization comes through the judge, and that's another related issue. Um, I mean, maybe I'm confusing here. But the fact that we have another system uh, for trademark and design, for instance, where we have the community calls, which is impossible for copyright because there is no uh, regulation on copyright, that I think helps a little bit harmonization in those other areas as well uh, because of this specialization of the judge, which are the community judge for the EU title. We don't have that for copyright because there is no copyright regulation. And I think that's one and maybe the, the most important reason to have a regulation for copyright because you would have then those judges who can better uh, discuss and maybe help the harmonization further. And I, I, I don't think it's completely impossible. Uh, I think it's better to spend 10 years on a copyright regulation than 10 years on the, just the exceptions and, and to try to fine tuning them. That would be really an achievement. So I, I, would, I mean, it's very provocative, but uh, we are here to, to be provocative. Uh, I think uh, that, that, that would be really an, an achievement. Okay. okay. Thanks. 
Yeah, perhaps less a question than an additional uh, comment. Of course, it's absolutely true that in patent law, the uh, communication amongst the judges works very well. But of course, in patent law, we do have a concentration of jurisdiction with regard. So the, the number of courts is much high, much greater in copyright. Yet on the higher level, the Supreme Court level, I think there is a uh, an increasing amount of cooperation, of co-information. And uh, that's, of course, something which an additional soft law program of the EU could strengthen by just uh, giving some uh, some input, some incentives to a kind of uh, a favor and uh, a strengthen these these cooperation efforts. But there is, a, Maria, there is another uh, argument, I think, that hasn't been addressed right now, which speaks in favor of, of making uh, uh, at least some of the exceptions mandatory. And that, in my opinion, is the fact that often when we get an answer from the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union, it's addressed to a particular legal situation in one particular country. Take the part of one case. Spain has a clear-cut law which says private copies only, no private, no 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 commercial copies. Uh, they are not exempt. Uh, if then you answer, can these commercial copies also be leveled? The answer is clearly no. I mean, I'm somewhat simplifying Padawan now. Look to other countries. There are countries where we have a combined system, and then we say, well, wait, 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 what does it mean? We have a levy on certain areas of commercial copying, which is allowed under the rule of the under the under the InfoSoc directive. But how do we relate the text of the InfoSoc directive, our national law, and the part of one decision? And if, as long as you don't have the uh, the exceptions mandatory on the same wording, you create probably more questions by one judgment from the ECJ, which simply which answers one particular national issue, uh, then uh, you are solved. So in the end, you end up with more questions, and that problem, I think, could be terribly could be avoided if you declare the uh, the exceptions mandatory. Would you like to comment, please? No, it's down. Okay. It's a good example. Uh, if 52A and 52B would be uh, mandatory. Uh, that would help, I think, people to understand the situation concerning levies as well. So to have a, a, a dual system, if that is the best one, or, or to have only 5-2-B, whatever, but, but not uh, not to, to combine in different ways those two exceptions. It, it makes the situation uh, un, uh, well, not understandable. And, uh, and, and uh, at the end, I think it, it's, it's not good for copyright. So that, that's the whole problem uh, with the structure as we have it. Yes, maybe an ideal world, but I think we have been talking about the Commission or have been trying to deal with private copying for more than 10 years, uh, and it's, yeah, good luck. <laughs> There's a question from audience, or probably comment. Well, thank you. It has been said already uh, anyway, but if we, uh, if the European legislature later tries to get uh, mandatory uh, exceptions, well, he has to deal with all the details as well. And then we will not have one Article 5, but 20 Article 5s or even more, and it will look like the Collective Management Directive. I would <laughs> warn <laughs> to have that. <laughs> Thank you. Comment? I don't know if you... But it's not necessary because it's mandatory that you have to have very long and detailed provisions. I mean, for me, the two are not necessarily linked. Not necessarily. Uh, besides, you're not obliged to, t to make them all mandatory. Some of them can be mandatory and not all of them. And, and maybe the explanation can be provided for in guidelines. Like in competition law is providing rules uh, by 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 regulation and help the understanding of the interpretation <coughs> of the rules through soft law systems or I don't know, and that would be very helpful in order to assess the economic impact and and to get, give some predictability on the application uh, of the of the exceptions. Might be an an answer to uh, not to have embedded it within the directive too long provision, uh, but helping. The, the judge to apply them throughout some tools like that. Um, it's clearly coming from a very particular background, I'm not even sure that kind of length of provisions is necessarily an evil anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, 
if we're looking for kind of more detailed analysis, then we might want more detailed rules. So, um, and I think uh, another thing that w interesting things people have said about gaining from different national judicial experience and sharing that expertise. And I think it's important to remember that um, uh, our legislatures have lived with this um, body of law for uh, 10 years or more now. And, you know, imaginative solutions have been found at national level to particular issues as well within the framework. So I'm thinking in terms of, um, you know, revising the directive, it might be, I just think of very close to home examples like data and text mining, you know, things which weren't even thought about necessarily um, almost 15 years ago, but which through detailed inquiry, the United Kingdom as an example, has developed a specific exception, which sits within the framework of the directive, but is closely directed to a particular issue. So, you know, there are lessons to be learned from legislative experience as well as judicial experience, possibly. Yeah, I think to, to, to comment uh, uh, that Valérie made uh, on uh, the role of guidelines, I think it's important F for me, probably to further step in harmonization should be more focused on, on other sources of the law than legislation. I, I think uh, there might be, of course, things that could still be done at the legislative level, but to, to multiply the source uh, of converging uh, forces, so the judge might be one, case law might be one, and, and for that there, would, there must be more circulation, but as well other, uh, I mean, sources like uh, guidelines. I, I was struck sometimes that in certain countries you have codifications by the parties involved about some exceptions uh, for certain types of work, uh, and, and the parties continue to define uh, to rule which remain general into law. But that's really helpful if you have it, and if we could have it, of course it's a dream, but if we could have it uh, between different countries to have this form of guidelines to interpret uh, some of the exceptions. And I think one of the job uh, of some EU institution might be to support that, that kind of, of convergence through the definition of guidelines by, by interested parties at national level and EU level, if, if it's possible. But uh, I agree it, it would be helpful. I think the, the, I, wish you, I wish we could do that. <laughs> Uh, but you get very, very, very quickly into an extremely difficult political situation, which is the parliament will say the commission is legislating through the back door. Guidance is hardly ever neutral. It's very, very, very difficult to provide guidance that, that cannot be accused of directed toward one side or the other. If, if you look at the last, we used to do guidelines. We used to do guidance, but it's not often the case any longer because politically it's, it's, it's seen as something that you're gonna do. The Commission could do soft initiatives to enhance cooperation among the judiciary in different member states and exchange of information. That's a different thing. But us coming with, voila, these are the eight or nine decisions in the area of private copying, and we're going to tell you what they mean, uh, wouldn't work. Some questions, comments, opinions? Um, there is one. Yes, thank you. I listen very carefully to everything, but I'm a bit confused because uh, I thought uh, the fact that there was a big diversity in the way exceptions were implemented in national legislations created a problem for the single market. That was the reason why among others, the directive had to be reopened, and why it was to bring legal certainty. And um, what I heard was, uh, yes, uh, there was a need for something predictable. And uh, I still don't understand how we can combine harmonized exceptions, or so mandatory exceptions, with a sort of guiding principles for, judge, for national judges to interpret these exceptions. I mean, judges will always interpret something, but if you add a general principle for them 
to be able to create an analog exception to exceptions already existing, I don't see how it can lead to a harmonized single market helping people to exchange works. That was my question. <laughs> Well, I, it seems to be a general feeling that I should answer. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I mean, perhaps this is, this is not really understandable, but of, I mean, you have full harmonization the moment the court has decided on one particular case. And then you know that, that this particular case, in the light of the more or less abstract criteria that you have in the legislation itself, must be decided in that and that way. So, I mean, the legal certainty for all 28 member states evolves whenever the Court of Justice rules on a particular type of use falling by analogy under the opening clause. I mean, it's not so different from, from what you have now. I mean, the, the, before the TU Darmstadt case, to use an example that I have used before, uh, before the TU Darmstadt case, we did not know whether limitations who want to um, establish a, a reading terminal can also digitize books in their holdings. And there were arguments against and there were arguments in favor and I think on both sides there were, well, arguments that, that could have convinced the court. So finally the court ruled in the Theo Darmstadt case and now we know this. And the same would happen if um, it was not a case where the court could directly rely on something that is already in the list, but the court would look at the list and would say, okay, this case does not really fit in any of the categories, so we think it is something very similar to one of the categories, so let's establish a new rule in that particular area. And of course, this new rule would also be limited to what the court says in this particular case. But I don't see where the problem for legal certainty is. I mean, how much certainty do you want to have after the court has dealt with a particular situation that posed a problem and the court has dealt with it and said, yes, the use is permissible, not because the legislator already said that it was permissible, but because we, on the basis of the factors which the legislator um, gave us, and because it is comparable to one of the cases in the list, think that this is also something that is perfectly okay. So I think um, it's not a difference in terms of legal certainty, it's a difference on how you arrive at legal certainty. And I mean, with or without the list of exceptions and limitations, this happens anyway. So uh, I gave during my presentation the example of um, the Google image search. Before we had those answers from the Netherlands, from Germany, from France, from Spain, we did not know whether the Google image search ser uh, service is a service that would survive scrutiny of the courts. And now we know that in Germany it survives uh, court scrutiny because the German judges think that it is implied consent. This is something that was not really predictable, but after the Supreme Court has decided in that area, we know this for sure. So there is legal certainty. And I mean, we academics, we will, we will keep complaining about whatever they do. I mean, the German academics are now complaining about this implied consent solution, that it is inconsistent and so on and so forth. But I mean, at least for the time being, um, this is what as, as, as legally certain as it gets. So, and also in terms of harmonizing effect, I mean, the harmonizing effect of what the German Supreme Court has done in that area is zero because we don't know whether in other member states there is a comparable doctrine of implied consent, which is a particular animal that has evolved in uh, German civil law. But if the de decision had been based on an analogy with uh, the right of quotation, for example, and had been confirmed by the Court of Justice, this would have been something that could be used as a starting point, as a solution in all 28 member states. And if um, the legislator uh, 10 years later makes an update of um, the copyright directive, the legislator can look at all those cases that have evolved in, in case law and can confirm them. 
This is also something that, that, that happened earlier at the national level. Um, I think that, uh, again, a German example, there, there was this, this case arising in Germany about um, the dispatch of um, uh, paper copies of scientific articles from the technical um, uh, library in Hannover on request of um, institutions and private parties. And there again, the, the German Supreme Court developed a new use privilege by analogy with uh, several pre existing private use principles. And then later on, I stand to be corrected by. The, 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 the German specialist in the room, but as far as I understood, this has, this, has been, uh, this has become a legal provision in the German Copyright Act later on. So it is, as far as I see it, quite a natural process, and with every case that is decided on the basis of such an open-ended provision, you have maximum legal certainty in that area. So, okay. And, um, I mean, I've done this before, and I know it's unpopular, but in support of kind of Martin's position, there's a phrase hovering over people's heads, isn't there? And there are two words. It's fair use that people are, 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 are thinking about. And, you know, I, I bring you news. Fair use under the US Copyright Act is supposedly notoriously uncertain, isn't it? Well, by no means is it as uncertain as the position we face at the moment. So. That would be my view on, on, on that, certainly. Well, but, but before a case is brought, it is uncertain. Yeah. Like, but like it has to start somewhere. You know, we yes. start <laughs> in a, a place and then we work it out over time. Over time, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> so anything else you would like to ask? Thank you. To change subject completely, I am. I have a specific question to Silke von Lovinsky because you mentioned several times in your speech that uh, judges of European Court of Justice are not experts in the field. So suppose they would be replaced. Uh, would you think it would improve matters on, on the contrary? Thank you. <laughs> Um, I would hope so, <laughs> but um, it seems to be very um, utopian at this point of time because the, the European Court is supposed to be a court of experts in European law, properly speaking, and not exactly they don't want to be experts in different uh, special branches. So I, I'm not sure that happens unless you would really establish a special court uh, for copyright and then not sure whether that's realistic. But if so, well, I, I do think yes, because they would probably have, for example, understood better the background of the Berne Convention or the read the commentary of the Berne Convention, which the European Court has quoted in the, in the um, connection with the communication right. I think they would have understood it correctly, but with a different, co with a copyright background. Um, yeah, I think it would be better. <laughs> I think colleague from Belgium would like to ask something. Yes, thank you. Uh, I had a, a question about the three, uh, three steps to tragedy uh, because I'm a bit uh, puzzled uh, by the answer that Martin, sorry, that, uh, the, by the answer that uh, Martin just gave. My question is, you, you started by saying um, it is, uh, uh, there are globally two systems. You have an open system, which has globally saying more uncertainty, closed list has more certainty. Um, then you s started off by giving an example by uh, um, the uh, uh, internet service providers, saying that before it was, uh, it was uh, they invented in Europe certain doctrines that were not provided for in uh, the directive, but they found other ways to uh, get a solution that they uh, wanted. Um, so my, uh, my question is a bit, are you in favor of a closed system or an open system? Because at the same time you said, if we adapt uh, the regulatory framework now, one should take learning from uh, the uh, uh, 
um, uh, solutions that have been dot, uh, b brought forth. I think you hinted that uh, in uh, certain countries, uh, search engines were allowed on the, uh, to do that, not on the basis of an exception, but they still were uh, allowed. I think you hint then to say, you should take it up when ad adapting the legislation, take that uh, guidance from courts and make it more clear and certain for everyone. But if you do that, if you take that solution or guidance from jurisprudence and you want to uh, put it to profit for the future, how do you do that then? Do you do that by stating it in a clear rule, by saying search uh, engines uh, can uh, uh, are uh, don't have do not infringe copyright or whatever, uh, or do you uh, keep an open rule such as uh, uh, a three steps test or uh, uh, the uh, fair use, uh, and then you say, well, if we have this open norm, we still have clarity. So that is my my question to resume: uh, Are you in favour uh, of an open norm or a closed norm? Uh, or a combination of both, uh, and uh, so that is basically my question. Which one do you think brings the more, most uh, clarity <coughs> and certainty? Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I'm sorry that, that this was this was unclear. Um, the the basic idea is um, try to come up with a copyright framework where you can solve these kind of challenges that are brought by. Uh, new consumer needs or new business models or whatever within copyright. That's that's the first point. Yeah. So establishing a copyright framework where you, where as a judge and so on you can stay within copyright and you do not have to look for um, other solutions in areas outside copyright law like an implied consent doctrine or a safe harbor doctrine, doctrine or abuse of right. These kind of things. And then. When you ask the question, how could such a copyright framework, uh, what could that be, how could that look like, then the first answer is keep all the specific cases of exceptions that we already have. So, I mean, keep the list in, in Article 5, this 2021 cases, and if you like, at another 2021 cases. So, make as many cases as you think uh, is necessary, make them um, legally certain by defining them clearly in the legislation itself. And then, on top of that, you have what I would call an opening clause, which says, well, if there is a kind of use um, that does not fall under one of the specific cases that have been listed, then the courts can consider whether this use should be permitted as well, as long as it is comparable with one of the specific cases on the list and complies with uh, the three-step test. Practically speaking, I do not know whether we are discussing a large number of cases that will fall under this opening clause. I mean, if you if you now, in your wisdom, um, um, devise a catalog of, let's say, uh, 30 um, specific exceptions and limitations, then I guess 90, 95% of uh, the future cases we will see will fall under one of the specific cases in the list anyway. So we are talking about the 5%, the hard nuts to crack, um, that remain. And for those hard nuts to crack, I would say an opening clause is a really good solution because you offer a framework within harmonized copyright law that can have a harmonizing effect the moment the Court of Justice deals with it. Now you leave it to national courts and national doctrines and the result is that, yeah, in terms of internal market, um, harmonization of these issues, and very often they are cross-border issues, whether or not you can offer a particular search engine or user-generated content or text or data mining, very often these things are cross-border issues, and you now leave it to national doctrines that are inconsistently applied, um, unreliable, I would say, and offer also for the industry very little room for drawing direct conclusions from a court decision that you see in just one member state. I don't know if that, if that clarifies the, the, the concept a bit. That is what, what I had in mind. Any questions? Uh, 
Well, just one idea at the end which broadens um, the discussion a bit, but I think it has already been mentioned. I think the most important or first limitation to write is the wording of the right itself. And um, there we, uh, I think maybe we miss something uh, with regard to, to the question who really uses a right or who immediately exploits the rights. And maybe the, if we find or broaden the concept of the liability of an intermediary to certain, a, a little bit, uh, we can, we do not need uh, jurisdiction or decisions like those uh, the European Court has, has, has given in all these link cases. So in my view, somebody who links is not really somebody who communicates to the public and you keep, could be treated a little bit different. And well, if we find solutions here, I think we do not need these solutions at the level of uh, exceptions and limitations. Maybe that's an idea for the future as well. Thank you. Maybe, uh, I'm not sure there was a question in your intervention, but uh, because you refer to the hyperlinking cases. Uh, by the way, I haven't read this morning, there was C, more entertainment, so nothing probably in the decision. That's one of those <laughs> unsatisfactory decisions. Okay, so we have the, the three decisions now. Um, Sorry? Yeah, okay. So we have basically only two. No, but I, I think on, on this issue, for me the problem is not well framed uh, because there is uh, no rules on indirect liability at EU level. And there is a mixed, a very confusing mixed uh, between direct and indirect liability. Uh, I think there shouldn't be any direct liability, there shouldn't be any communication to the public for whatever reasons we don't have to, to discuss, but here we see the problem that there is nothing on indirect liability, no no, no principle there, and then uh, the court is using an, in, an unsatisfactory some conditions like there should be a, an authorization for the content uh, uh, that you are linking to first. Um, as a conditions, uh, for not having a communication to the public. I mean, it, it, it starts to be crazy. Uh, I mean, of course, if, if the content is illicit and you are linking to it, I think there shouldn't be any communication to the public, but you might be liable, of course, if you know it's illicit and if you encourage or facilitate, but that's indirect liability. <laughs> and the fact that we don't have it at EU level makes, uh, I think, the problem wrongly uh, framed, and, and that's really a problem. So, for instance, yeah, uh, there, there should be something uh, on indirect liability. And don't mix direct and indirect liability on hyperlinking. Otherwise, you lose copyright completely. Because it's, and there we, we don't agree, huh? because if hyperlinking is a communication to the public, then you have a very important principle in copyright law that you should first uh, ask for an authorization. And I think that's not feasible. That's not feasible uh, before you are linking. Uh, if you would have to first ask for an authorization because it's a communication to the public, I think. The internet cannot live with that. I prefer to keep this principle within copyright that you need a, a prior authorization, but that, that means that you cannot consider its direct liability. So uh, concerning, but, but the fact is that the, 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 the whole in the EU law makes the approach of the court, I mean, complicated and, and that's not satisfactory. Alan, on, on that one, Rather than going into direct or indirect liability, wouldn't it be better take take the reproduction right? We have a broad definition of the reproduction right, and then we have five one. Wouldn't it be better to go and restate a broad concept of communication to the public, and that them have an exception for certain purposes? In the same manner that we have used five one to get browsing out, 
couldn't we, rather than get into direct or indirect liability, which I find very, very hard to try to imagine doing at EU level, say, okay, okay, we remind you that an act of communication is an act of communication is an act of communication. That's what it is. Someone's communicating, someone's engaging into an act of exploitation. But we need to have an exception uh, which takes out the type of things we don't want to get to. That might be another possibility. It's either in the definition of the right or in the exceptions. Uh, I, I agree. It shouldn't be a direct uh, liability. So w whether you treat it under the notion of the right or the exception, that is something I think that can be discussed. But, but, but you shouldn't deal through the notion of direct infringement, something that is only an indirect infringement. So if you consider that, I mean, that, it's a that hyperlinking is a communication to the public, and then you introduce an exception. I mean, I prefer the other way around, just to, to design to write and exclude uh, hyperlinking. But yeah, that, that might be a possibility. But then, no, I don't think it's, it's the best <laughs> way. I'm just thinking, but uh, why, <laughs> why do complicate that way? would have been, my, since you mentioned me, also my response to you, because there are very different ways of hyperlinking, and commercial ones, non-commercial, for different purposes. If I, on my home page, my personal home page, want to make a link to someone else's website, I have the possibility to ask him first. That's no problem. Um, if there are mass hyperlinking sites, that's something different. And if they are commercial, it's different from whether they are non-commercial. So I think also the tool of an exception would be best here to solve the problem. Okay. Anything to add from the speakers? <coughs> well, I guess we have come to six o'clock. <laughs> it's been very interesting uh, discussion and very interesting presentations we heard today. So thank you very much to our speakers. And we also would like to give those uh, small examples of Latvian design to each of you. And I guess uh, they deserve one session of applauses again. <laughs>